Thanks very much. Okay, so as I was saying to myself, my name is Jake Monroe. I'm a cell management specialist with Amafra for our field crop unit. And it's my pleasure to be the moderator for this session. So let's jump right into it. I'm gonna very briefly introduce our, our four speakers and then I'm gonna turn it over to them for, for a brief presentation. After that, we'll get into a, a q and um, I'll be asking some questions and then I'll be looking for questions from the audience as well. So Adam Hayes uh, is uh, a, our former soil management specialist for field crops with Amafra. He retired back in 2019. And since then he's been doing contract work, um, helping to coordinate and implement the on-farm project with the soil resource group and keeping him very busy. Um, Ed Rudzant has farmed cash crops in the Rodney area for 40 years and he's an on-farm cooperator. You're going to hear from him. And I'd invite Ed, uh, both Ed and Tyler, the growers to turn on your cameras as well. Uh, Margaret Ryby is a certified crop advisor and the natural resource scientist at SRG. You can give a wave, Margaret. Uh, her area of expertise include best management practices, soil health, and environmental considerations in production agriculture. And Tyler McBlain, who, who we were introduced to about 10 minutes ago, is an on-farm cooperator in Eastern Brant County. And along with his wife and parents, he operates a custom farming business and grows corn, soybeans, wheat, and oats. And so now I'll invite Margaret to uh, open up your slideshow and I'll hand it over to all of you to present. Okay, I'm just uh, trying to see if Tyler was able to get in or not. He was having some problems, but uh, anyways, here's our slides. <laughs> Okay, next slide, Margaret, please. Okay, we're going to start with uh, Ed's site. And as you can see from the map, he's located just south of Rodney, which is about 45 minutes southwest of London. If you look at the aerial photograph there, you can see an outline of where the plot is. Uh, his soils are a loamy sand to sand textured soils. And if you see close to the buildings where the, the woodlot uh, comes close to the plot there, there's a dark spot. That's an area where there's about 6% uh, uh, organic matter and it's poorly drained. And as you move back uh, towards the back of the field, it's about a 3% slope. Um, it's uh, becomes rapidly drained and the organic matter levels uh, are lower there. You can see from the um, zoom or the um, drone footage, the front of the plot is towards the front of the screen. It rises up, there's a little dip and then at the back uh, of it, it uh, rises up again. Thanks. Okay, I guess you want me to start my uh, soil health journey. Uh, 1980s, we parked our uh, chisel plow. We started no-tilling our soybeans. 2005, we started our soil amendments. Started with biosolids. In 2011, we started vertical tillage. In 2013, went to uh, strip tilling with a fertilizer cart, applying fertilizer in the strips. 2015, we started adding uh, cereal rye after a soybean harvest. In 2020, uh, we're enjoying the benefits of these BMPs I've been practicing since 2005. Uh, since 2005, our organic matter has increased by 1.2% on the sandy soil. Drainage has improved, it's less erosion of our soil and the nutrients. Noticeable increase in the earthworm activity. Soils are darker and richer in color. Yields have increased and uh, handle the droughts and uh, flood flooding years like last year. We had 36 inches of rain and still produced a decent yield. And uh, these maps here, 2007, um, you can see the poor areas of the fields. There are more clay content in those fields. In the present day, here's a map and you can see the big difference with the um, 
better drainage, so organic matter is increased. Uh, you can see from the colors, it's, it's yielded a lot better. Back in early, earlier years, our uh, yields were probably the same as the county average. Now we're probably 20, 30 bushels over the county average year to year now. And the lower pictures here shows our uh, crop residue, the strip till. That's in, uh, I guess, from June, that picture. And in September, all the crop residue is gone. So the worms are doing their job, the microbes are, they're my tillage. So, uh, this, uh, next slide, or it's Adam's next. Oh, no, okay. Here's our uh, plot uh, 2020. Uh, after soybean harvest, we did four treatments. But, uh, treatment one was rye planted after soybeans. Then our treatment two is our check strip. Treatment three is the bio pellets on after the harvest. Treatment four was our bio pellets plus rye. Bio pellets were put two metric tons per acre, and the rye is planted about two bushels per acre. And then in uh, 2021, we, we had corn, so we interceded a cover crop mix of uh, till radish, crimson clover. Annual ryegrass, 14 pounds an acre altogether. And uh, this poor communication, uh, they put the bio pellets on the whole plot. So it wasn't supposed to be bio pellets on our uh, check strip. So our check strip, I guess, uh, just doesn't have the cover crop. And we, treatment three has the bio pellets again. Treatment four is our interseeded crop with the bio pellets. You see the pictures here, the April 4th planted our cereal, cereal rye. And then uh, probably you know, five days after that, it was sprayed. And we strip tilled about the 23rd of April. It shows the dead crop, the dead rye, and the strips are nice and clean. And here's our uh, same year. Here's our interstate cover crop. You can see lots of the annual rye grass and the uh, tilt riders. And then in the fall, you don't see much of the you know, rye grass. We did have 36, say 36, 36 inches of rain through the summer, so it's a lot of rain. <laughs> and uh, but you still see the tilt the till radish. Okay, Haddon. Okay, the um Rye was, uh, I should, the rye was um, um, planted right after the biopath pellets, the end of September 2020. And you can see uh, April 10th, the picture in the middle at the bottom, uh, the rye growth that there was uh, then. We did biomass uh, measurements there. And you can see in the graph uh, the rye in the cover crop. Uh, strip had just over half a ton per acre of uh, biomass and then the rye in the cover crop and organic amendment strip had just under uh, three quarters of a ton per acre of um, biomass so statistically significantly more um, biomass with the <clears throat> um, organic amendment and the rye. Uh, the rye growth wasn't was a bit variable and also um, was, you know, probably we harvested it uh, early April um, to get it uh, killed ahead of uh, planting the corn. So um, if it was left longer, obviously would have been more growth. Uh, with the interseeding, we did biomass measurements in early November. And again, just over half a ton of uh, biomass from the interseeding. And with in the cover crop strip and about three quarters of a ton um, per acre of um, biomass in the interseeded row. Again, it was um, a bit variable. Um, certainly all that rain helped give uh, good cover crop growth. Um, but, uh, you know, so it was fairly decent uh, biomass uh, for the, um, <clears throat> um, for an interseeding crop.
Okay, so moving on to uh, Tyler's site, he is located uh, southwest of Hamilton. Uh, his soil types are quite different from Ed's in that he is farming mainly a uh, halting clay. Um, his site is uh, here on the aerial image. Uh, we have some clips to silt loam texture soils on those upper landscape positions which uh, you will see in the uh, back here of the plots close to the building. So he had some grade in that plot, about 5% slope. Uh, obviously the lower landscape positions being more poorly drained with those clays uh, to more of a moderately well-drained system <clears throat> in the upper landscape position. So what was unique about Tyler's site was that he has a side-by-side -side comparison. So his home farm has been under good soil health management practices for decades. Um, and he just recently obtained the Douglas farm about seven years ago. And um, he's obviously instilling those management practices on that farm now. Uh, when we first went to the site, we did do a pedological survey. And we noted that on the Douglas farm, those upper landscape positions had lost about 41 centimeters of topsoil. So uh, elaborate a little bit on what Margaret said. Um, in, it's a general, a large portion of our acreage is clay that I like to call one day clay. So we base a lot of our management decisions on that soil type. Um, so growing up, I shadowed my grandfather, Bruce and my father, Barry, um, and was taught at a young age the, the importance of BMPs. Um, our farm has been long-term no-tillers um, since um, started playing with it in the eighties. Um, we actually ordered the first 15 foot 750 drill in the fall of 88 in sold in Canada. Um, so we're long-term no-tellers of soybeans and wheat. Um, we're minimum tilt corn. Um, my family's been always been a strong believer in crop rotation cover crops. Um, we were we grew clover for both cover crop and seed in the 60s, 70s, and all the way up through until approximately 2015 when we transitioned to more of a multi-species cover crop. Um, reasoning behind that was we have some farms we don't grow corn on, it's just not economical to grow on those farms. So we do a rotation of two-year bean, one-year wheat. And with red clover, we had to till, till the clover under to be able to get a dry seed bed in the spring. So we've transitioned, started transitioning to a multi-species cover to be able to no-till soybeans into that um, as a long-term goal was us to re for reducing tillage. Um, 2017, we transitioned um, the corn into a strip till program again to trying to reach our goal of eliminating as much tillage as possible so that basically eliminated 66% of the tillage done for our corn crop. Um, it also allows us to variable rate our or nutrients rate in the strip for that corn crop. Um, and then that brings us to today on the on-farm project. Um, since we're, we've committed to no-till, it says 1995. Um, these improvements, there's no true date I can put to that um, as things have changed since we started no-tilling. Um, but one of the big things we've noticed is just walking on these farms as we've slowly transitioned and eliminate tillage in our operation as much as possible. It's not like walking on a concrete parking lot. It's more like walking on a spongy, a sponge, essentially. Um, our clays have became, as we strive forward here, um, more forgiving. Um, as some of our clays traditionally are very unforgiving, we've starting to, they're starting to act a little more like a healthier soil, better soil type. Um, We've improved water holding capacity and drainage. Um, so on a dry year, we've been able to have a little more water there, or the, the plants have been able to withstand the drier weather a little longer versus when we get a heavy rain, like was talked about earlier with the weather changing, the water's not pooling like it used to. Um, our soil's more alive, um, high, higher earthworm counts, um, and just bug life in general. Um, we've reduced erosion and then also Number one for us is we've increased yields. Um, there's two yield maps there, and one's from 2000, one's from 2021. There is a little bit of noise there, just lost weather in that. But in 2000, that, this is the farm right next door to where this project is. Um, it went 102 bushels an acre for corn, and this year it went 236. Um, we've noticed that we've the variabilities in the farms, we've kind of, I'm not going to say eliminated, but we're, we're, evening out the farm, um, the variability in the farm a little more. Next slide. So our on-farm project is 
was mentioned is kind of two parts consists of two farms. Um, we have the one farm behind my house that we've owned since 1952 that's been in um, a fairly good crop rotation, fairly good management using BMPs. Since then, my grandfather, like I said, my father were both strong believers in that. So it's had a, it's been treated very well for a heavy clay farm. Um, and the farm right next over the fence, we um, took over management there in 2015. So the first thing we could see when we took it over, and even to this day, you walk from one field and just cross over the fence line, just back to that under your feet. One field is like walking on a sponge. The next one is, especially when we first took it over, it was like walking in a parking lot. Um, so we have uh, have a lot a lot of work ahead of us to bring that to our the standards where we'd like it to be. So we've since 2015, it has been in several co cover crops. Um, we manage it the same as the field next door, just for logistic purposes. So it gave us a two strips on either side of the fence. One in both sides, we have a check with no cover crop planted, um, approximately an acre, I believe, and then on. Uh, the rest of the fields treated how we like we tr normally treat it with a cover crop blend um and we're able to watch is on the one side on the douglas farm as we increase or going forward we can see the the benefit to using our cover crops versus the check should shouldn't be able to compare the two um and then we can also compare it to the farm that's been in long-term rotation um comparing again taking the cover crop out of that rotation in that spot are we going backwards or how fast are we still gaining on that side and then be able to compare the two? Um, unfortunately, um, it was supposed to be planted to rye um, after the corn crop came off, but as most of Ontario, we had a very, very wet fall. So that plan got thrown out the window and actually we're gonna frost seed oats onto it. Um, it hopefully here in the beginning of March when we're out seeding our, the rest of our oat crop. Um, and just showing in the fall of 2020, that's what the cover crop looked like and what it looked like when we went through with the strip tiller. Come spring again, it just shows the strips that were made on this farm. And then the fall, just before it was harvested, you can see the difference. Um, from the cab, I could see when I was, we were putting our second application nitrogen on, we could see a difference in the treatment, um, but it was not what we expected to see. Um, on the Douglas farm where there was no cover crop, the crop look, looked, appeared healthier, was darker green. Where there was cover crop, it was a lighter green color versus on my home farm, which has been in an um, a long-term rotation, the lighter colored corn was actually where there was no cover crop. So they were actually opposite for whatever reason. So anyway. Okay. So just to kind of speak to what Tyler is, his um, anecdotal evidence there from the cap, he was seeing what we were able to measure. So if we look at uh, these two indicators of soil health, we're just gonna go over them quickly. Uh, we have organic matter, aggregate stability on the, the dark green bars are the home farm and the light green bars are the Douglas farm. We have the lower mid and upper landscape positions. Uh, you see those air bars are the standard deviation and then bars with the same uh, letter are not statistically different. So, Focusing on organic matter, which has traditionally been used as an indicator of soil health, we can see there that the home farm is trending to be higher in organic matter and sometimes statistically so um, in that lower landscape position. So I think this what this is indicating is what well, you can see here that you know landscape position is uh, an important factor when you're considering doing these kind of tests. Um, if we move to aggregate stability, uh, it is a measure of the soil's ability, a soil aggregate's ability to resist uh, falling apart when wetted. So it's kind of like an erosion um, measurement, erosive ability. So if you uh, look at that graph, similar trends, the home farm being higher aggregate stability, um, except for in that upper landscape position. So that was kind of surprising. And uh, that could be attributed to the good soil health management that has already been occurring on that farm for the last seven years. Um, what we can say though, all of these numbers, all the aggregate stability numbers are ranked very high on the uh, Cornell Soil Health Rating Scale. So these are bad numbers by any means. And if you look at uh, that handful of Haldeman clay in that bottom corner, I doubt most people would expect it to look that way. Tyler and his family have done a really good job of managing this, this kind of clay over time. And uh, we can see that those management practices are making a difference. Okay, thanks very much to the four of you for 
um, for that that great overview of the two sites and, and what you've been learning there. Um, maybe, Margaret, could I ask you to just stop sharing the slide just to, just to open up the Zoom screen for everybody? Thanks very much. And I'll, I'm gonna, we've got about uh, nine minutes left for, for, for discussion. So I'm just gonna kick it off with a, with a question for Ed and Tyler. And you've both already alluded to this um, in your slides, but you know, I think what's really interesting about these two sites is that they're quite different soil types. Um, and also, you know, um, you've both been doing these BMPs for, for quite a number of years. So I'm, maybe I'll start with you, Ed, um, and then Tyler, you can answer the same question afterwards. Um, how do you feel that your soil type plays into how quickly you see results from implementing BMPs? And, and do you think you see more tangible impacts a little, a little more rapidly given on your sand to your soils than maybe other growers might in the province? Well, I'm comparing my sand to my clay is more clay loamy. I mean, that's what I have to compare it to. But uh, with the biosolids, I saw within two years the results on the sand of your soil. But it takes many years for seeing the increased organic matter. Uh, the land has uh, seen the largest increase of the sand of your soil with the lowest organic matter, see the fastest increase. It's due because it is very low. <laughs> um, with the clay, the best advantage was uh, starting the cover crops on the more clay, tighter clay areas. It broke, made it looser, more mellow, and then the roots get down deeper. The worms started working on. It's a combination with uh, less tillage too, going to strip tilling, leaving the trash on top. And the uh, biggest thing is on the stress years, seeing the benefit on a drought, drought year versus even a real wet year, like we had this past year. Um, sand, it's lighter ground, faster increase. I, it's hard to say. I, I'm not sure. Um, I answered that correctly. <laughs> no, that's great, Ed. <laughs> Over to you, Tyler. How would you respond to that question? Well, on our the heavy clay there in best man, just the first thing eliminating tillage makes a huge difference on our soil type. You're starting to eliminate some of that crusting and that. So it depends what portion where you're starting, but drainage. Um, just implementing cover crops on. We have a farm that has zero tile on it, and, and after some of the deluge rains we've had, it has no ponding. It's amazing that just between the, the root channels, the worm channels, the, um, everything, the water's just, and the sponge that's there, it's just soaked up and disappears. We're not getting the pooling like we used to see. Um, it, yeah, the biggest thing I think in our soil type, the first step is the, the elimination of some of the tillage. It really has helped it rebuild itself and then cover crops and everything else just adds to that. And Tyler, since we've got you speaking, and I thought that Mark has asked a good question in the chat, and maybe you've read it already, but he's just asking if you could comment on advice for how to communicate with growers on, on clay soils that are reluctant to reduce tillage and incorporate cover crops because of delayed soil warming and planting. Can you comment? Um, I have lots of friends that I have to I try and communicate this with all the time, and it's it's a struggle. Um, you know, with the proofs in the pudding, proof is do yeah, I guess. It's nerve right. The first time we ever no tilled into a cover crop for soybeans, we had a, there were some sleepless nights going into it. It's nerve wracking, but once you do it, it you have to take some show of them that it's possible. Um, and a lot of these things and no tills, a good example with soybeans, there sometimes is a lag in yield a year for the first year or two as things are rebuilding themselves. But I'll put our yields against anything around here now that we've been doing it long enough that there's not not even a yield drag. I think there's a yield benefit. There's definitely a yield benefit now. So it's, I think, talk, get them to talk. Someone doing it would be the best and visually see it. And just a very quick follow up on that, Tyler. Like in terms of corn planting for you versus your neighbors on similar soils, neighbors who might be conventionally tilling, I, time difference. Um, I'm going to say it, it's it depends. Um, as we go forward with improving soil health, I think we're equal, if not some on certain farms, getting on there sooner. Um, we do have to be patient just it's heavy clay you have to be patient for the right time and but if if it's ours is fit and theirs is fit it's equal timing now if not like i said sometimes sooner because we're building a little bit of a burn to get it to dry out a little bit sooner yeah perfect thanks thanks for that perspective um this i, I want to take it now to a question for for anybody to comment on uh, uh, margaret and adam as well um so I, I guess what I've observed with the with the what I've seen from your presentation and also from uh, following some of the other on farm plots is that I, I think you guys have have um, tried to make it as simple as possible for the for the growers to implement 
Um, and I'd just be curious for comments on, you know, how have you found that balance between rigor and replication versus practicality and making sure that it, it actually gets done? Um, anybody want to start with a comment on that? Uh, sorry, uh, can I ask a question? Ahmed? I am Ahmed from London, Ontario. Sorry, we're actually just, if you can enter your questions in the chat, we're just really tight on time. So we're going to keep it. We're going to keep just the questions in the chat. Oh, okay. But thanks Sorry. for your interest, Ahmed. And feel free to enter a question in the chat. I'll get to it if I can. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I'll comment. I've, oh, I've done a lot of test plots over the years and uh, doing a side-by-side -side trials. That's what we've done with selling solid crops and, and uh, just repeating two, three reps side-by-side. -side. It's, it's what we've done for a long time. And, and I, Gives you a good indications with multiple growers doing the same thing and you get the whole scope of things a lot better. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, that's so, and you're talking like, yes, do your two or three reps, but then if you've got other people doing the same thing, you know, replication by by multiple sites, which I think is is a lot of the idea behind this whole on farm concept as well. Margaret, did you want to jump in? Um, I think what Ed said was pretty much covered that um, I think it is important that, you know, obviously from a scientific standpoint, we want all those replications, uh, randomized complete block is obviously the standard, gold standard, but uh, that, that's not overly practical on a lot of farms. Um, and we were just fortunate that with Tyler, we could have a side by side and it's not replicated. We know that, but it is a really good demonstration of, of what we can show in a strip. And if strips are what guys are able to do and, and women or ladies are able to do, then um, I think that there is a lot of information to glean from those, even though they're not your replicated uh, complete block kind of designs. Yeah, and we, we made an effort to, to match um, the strip widths to equipment and try to randomize, but also adjust the um, some of the treatments to help with, you know, planting um, cover crops or applying um, organic amendments because the spreaders aren't always the same width that uh, you want to fit things. So we tried to really uh, work well to accommodate that. Any, any additional comments from you, Tyler, or should I, should I move on? I think everyone said it all. It's um, in our case, we're trying to do, we have plots trials on every farm. So it's part of our operations try, already doing that. And they kept it very simple by making it just one rep. Um, so, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's part of, we need to be able to go forward. We need to be able to see what's better, what's working, what's not. Yeah, for sure. And I see the, the clock is ticking down on us. We've got uh, just over one minute left. And just to note, um, I, Margaret and Adam, we're going to share some cell health measurements. I think Margaret will, I think we'll have to hold off on that. Just, I just want to fit one last question in from the chat and, and perhaps that could be shared out afterwards to the participants if, if that's possible. Um, I, I just wanted to, there was a question about red clover here and I know Tyler, you've got an experience. I'm not sure about you, Ed. Just in the last 53 seconds that we have, um, there's a question from Lee asking, uh, have either of you seen a difference in cover crop mixes and the impact on cell health goals? Or are you seeing a difference at all, uh, you know, relative to red clover? So I've worked with you, Jake, and on a lot of these, um, we've, I strong believe in red clover. It's just in our operation, it's kind of, we've went the multi-species. Were you playing with oats, peas, rash, and buckwheat? And yes, we have seen a benefit of mixing up that multi-species. We we fell on those three, four, three plants for the properties that they give us the benefit for. So yes, there is just, versus just going oats, yes, it's a great way to start simple, start. But yes, I'm, I, I'm a, I really love my buckwheat. So um, that's one that we do see a advantage being there with what it's doing. Um, I don't know if that answers that, but the red clover is wonderful. It's just it's the catch was a struggle, and then being able to deal with it on certain farms. So. Yeah, the cons the consistency. And Ed, did you have co comments yes. you want to make? Yeah, uh, I, we've had wheat with uh, red clover and that, and a lot of times we have dry years. It's tough, a tough catch sometimes. So I found cereal rye is always been easy, grows easy for late season and uh, simple, but. Yeah, clover sometimes does dies or doesn't get established good enough. Unless you're a livestock guy, you can have silage, you get crop corn off early and you can plant. Yeah, clover would be good for that. But we have to get our rings when we need them. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, that consistency and 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 add your you're utilizing rye, especially where you've got a corn soybean rotation, and that gives you 
the opportunity to get Cover Crop established a bit later. Um, we're down to the final nine seconds. So thank you so much to Adam, Ed, Margaret, and Tyler. Uh, it's been a pleasure hearing from you. And I think we're going to be sent back to the main room now. Thanks, everyone. Welcome back, everybody. As you're rejoining the uh, main room, just might want to mute yourself again if you were having a good conversation in the breakout room and have your microphone on.